Dazia Grego Sykes is an Oakland-based performance artist and writer whose vulnerable yet fearless work explodes cultural taboos around race and sexuality and places him in a lineage that includes Exus Hemphill and Marlon Riggs. Grego Sykes' project titles are direct, even confrontational. His album called Make Me Black speaks to navigating cultural inscription in the work of self-actualization self and exploring, quote, racism as a form of dysmorphia, end quote. The name of his performance piece, Am I a Man, promises a deep investigation and confrontation of masculinity and its codified tropes. It, quote, maintains a core identity based in manhood while bending the ideologies around what it actually means to be a man, end quote masculinity reconciled with the femme, the swishy, the sissy, the other. His new poetry collection is called Black Faggotry, which I would hope might provoke a small crisis in the mind of a heterosexual reader. Faggotry is the dark art of being a faggot. A faggot is not a victim, rather a queer revolutionary, one whose potential exists outside of the strictures of heteronormativity, who knows camp and play and aestheticizes the brutal pain of exclusion and subjection. You made us faggots, but it's a position that we're keeping to your horror, redefining, turning into a vessel of allowance and expansion and now, faggotry is complicated and complemented by blackness. Black faggotry is an intersectional, multidimensional construct. And Grego Sykes declares, quote, I am a place where roads from seemingly separate origins come together, end quote. Within the pages of his debut collection, he strives to answer the questions, quote, what does it mean to be marginalized, biracial, black, and finally gay? How do these identities alter when they intersect? What never seems to change about the black or the gay experience, end quote. Grego Sykes' most notable solo play, A Best of Fringe Winner, bears a title that is not within my prerogative as a white person to repeat. He accosts the audience with the history of American minstrelsy of white performers ridiculing and warping black identity by appearing in blackface himself, embodying while also metaphorizing racially violent imagery in a manner reminiscent of Spike Lee's film Bamboozled before washing the makeup off, shearing the veil, revealing his true face as he recites the piece Black Privilege, asking, why can't black be a pretty thing? And delving into a poetic rumination on colorism in elementary school, Grego Sykes told a white boy not to say the N-word for the first time and was beaten up as a consequence. When he told the teacher what he had been called, the reply was, well, aren't you? Tracy Morris once told her performance studies class that she doesn't like to use the N-word in her work because there's too much blood on it, which is a self-evidently valid position for a Black artist working under the weight of centuries of American violence. But Grego Sykes' approach differs in that getting bloody is vital to his process. He makes it clear that he's intimate with racialized violence, whether he speaks or not. He writes, I don't want to speak, I want to scream. I don't want to speak, I want to fight. His battle tactics disrupt the flow of entrenched power dynamics, reclaiming the forbidden language of the oppressor, usurps and reorganizes its semantic authority. Grego Sykes challenges and transfigures potent stereotypes that have metastasized in the American psyche. He subverts social objectification of blackness by stating, quote, we are living monuments much too close to the massacre, end quote. Reading Black Faggotry is an achingly resonant and intense experience that demands much of the reader, but it's also funny and sexy, full of defiance, positivity, and ass-eating. It covers a wide range of urgent topics in a variety of styles, 
mixing influences from hip hop, spoken word, jazz, and experimental poetry. Grego Sykes reminds me of Saul Williams and Amiri Baraka at their best. And I'm incredibly excited to, that he is joining us now. Please welcome Dazier Grego Sykes. Thank you so much. I think that was the most respectful and beautiful and I've never received an introduction that was just so heartfelt and so detailed. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it so, so much. I want to thank Segway Reading Series and Artist Space for having me here today. Um, I am going to be reading predominantly from my book, Black Faggotry, that was published by Nomadic Press. Uh, and I'm looking to give you a taste of what this collection of poetry is, is really about. So there's, we're going to jump from kind of one theme and one energy to the other. Um, I wanted it to feel like a collection you could open up on any page or a collection you could read from page one all the way through. Uh, and I'm hoping to create that experience for you today. Thank you for being here. And uh, let's just delve in. The first piece that I'm going to be reading for you is called Middle Passage. Born of cotton wombs, softly whipped to coffin, nappy hair to prune, in hopes to stop the laughing. Blistered foot is doomed to walk another day. Uneducated tongue, careful what you say. Broke shoulders spend your life, hesitant but look. See not what holds today, but pray for what's been took. We connect to our ancestors through the dialect we speak. We protect our broken English, our so-called poor grammar, because more important than any language is the oral history we must keep. It is swimming between our tongues and the very roof of our mouths. It is an accent from Africa, United States, North or South. We are the children who have no written language. We hieroglyph pilgrims of the ocean. We voodoo prints, eyes weeping willows, green moss and forgotten days of money lions that still know our names. They pace behind bars and zoos, not unlike too many young black brothers. The growl disturbs the once sweet dreams we hear them under covers. Can't reach for the hand of God, but pass the hand of mothers. Hoard the love that's in your heart, then look for some from others. He thrashes his hips against his lover, refusing to turn over and become receptive. Believes that death is born of absorbing his lover's own dying seed. Nothing grows, wearing skin like withered leaves. Press your ear to my chest. Hear the mischievous wind left seeping heart, keeping kisses left by breath that cannot be perceived. Do not forget, the beloved can always leave. Water for us bringing pirates with swords unsheathed. Froth on the shore, undrying saliva of African bones and names that will never be retrieved. I look to her, I call out cousin. I scream, uncle asked, do you remember me? Was it the vessel? Was it the ocean? Or the pale skins that stole you from me? No tears travel from the green in my Atlantic. I'm middle passaged tenderly. Thank you. This next piece is not in my book, um, but it was born out of the protests and particularly out of the death of George Floyd. And I wanted to read it this afternoon. And it's called Another Seed for the Lynching Tree. Everyone and everything just wants to be loved. I am a living, can't breathing being. I tried to remain undisturbed by the amount of hate focus on me. You see, my skin is not white and it never will be. I am just a seed for the lynching tree, a me to endure all forms of cruelty, producing a deformed psyche, my black skin in the hands of the white frivolity. They invent their beauty as they pick at the scabs of our callous backs. Guns like ropes provide no slack. I'm a victim of police who are supposed to protect me. You don't care my father can't stand in his own garden without being called nigger. You wake every day hearing another black body has been planted, revel in an ever so in vain the necessity to feel shame and then place work back on my community. You are wrapped in privilege, none of which would you shed to spare me. I feel disgusted. I look at your withered pale leaves, failing, falling, and diseased. You are my whiteful enemy. The worst of whom will read this and say they understand, the best of which will confess that they want an all white land, and I do bite my thumb. 
and that will discover your one true face. I'll cover it with my spittle, urine, and cum. Even as I smile across the aisle, my church pew knows God's light will only ever harm the wicked. I've survived you for 42 years. I've buried, buried my slain brothers and sisters in a river of uncried tears. You who make the tooth grit, the vein swell and the tongue pop. I don't hate white people. This is just the sound I make when I take time to see and love myself. On a totally different note, a little palate cleanser. <laughs> um, this piece is called Kiss My Ass. <clears throat> I love a man who has the audacity to fuck me with his tongue, all the while talking shit this one time, literally. He be tasting me on the inside part like hungry infant, I mama and yeah, I call out daddy and translate what sounds like a mumble but surely feels like annunciation. Sometimes he make midnight snack out my ass like he mosquito, I wake up itching Knowing I've been bit, he plays like he's sleeping and I'm awake and now I be needing it. I asked why he likes it. Him say, is warm, is smooth, is good. I say some folks think he's nasty. He says he's not nasty, tells me, fuck you. Me, say kiss my ass and then his dick grow. This piece is called Wings. All I have is a single feather to prove I once had wings. My satin skin has turned to leather a throne without its king. I still remember from what I come. A paradise has turned to slum. I'm sober now, but taste the rum. A wine is drank fermented plum. Look for me at dawn in dusk, wearing smoke like Jovan Musk. A blown out speaker hears Sade sing to the crippled fairy that burnt his wings. This piece is called The Atmosphere of a Dream. It swims, cool and reflective, vibrantly colorless, saturated and introspective. Be here now, at least for a little while. No matter how present you are, it's impossible to know if you'll remember a single thing. Spider webs with no spiders, silkworms playing with their friends. It is nothing, it is crisp, it is absent and bright. It is the end and the beginning, it is everything because it is. There is no point in waiting around here, no point in traveling down pale cotton candy lined streets. You will not meet the inhabited. Somehow you've always known who they are. This is your infinite everything. If a word must first be a thought before it's spoken into being, then these are not words. These are mad ramblings of a fumbling God. Now you can fly. You will always catch the ball. These words are things, things that may be received by a man who wants to be changed by the quality of words. This is a place where thoughts are ever changing their form. They morph at a speed undetectable to the human eye, so you close them and venture back into your mind. There is room here for every universe. Sometimes a star will walk on by, not concerned with who you are, not bothered that you are a man, not bothered that you can only ever be jealous. You wish to see it up close and now, none of your formal wishes apply. Constellations are inconsiderate things. Things are considered and deconstructed. Remember, this is a place where words are thoughts and thoughts are things. Don't puzzle yourself with stars, sherbet, or red doors. You don't get to know. You do get to wander. Wander up a marvelous thing. Wander down any corridor. Open any drawer. You get the feeling the gist and the desire all pressed between your mind and an intergalactic sky. Stars are allowed to get tired of being wished upon, tired of pushing cornea into the light of the eye, tired of looking stationary just because it eases your mind. Stars know who they are. They know that you will never see beyond your own sun dotted confusion. Refreshed, born over and over again, 
always being born, never finding time to die. There is no time in this place. Time is absurd. You could connect it all to a single second, but first you'd have to find one. Seconds are rare. They breathe in time. How long is a lifetime in an atmosphere without time? There isn't so much to know. There is plenty to believe. Beliefs are, are not thoughts, they are ideas. Ideas are free. Ideas can change. Even ideas are ideas. Knowing is an earthly thing. Knowing is an atom bomb, a forest on fire. The eyelash that scratches out the eye of its host. Remember, this is an atmosphere. This is not a place. This piece is called Antebellum Dream. He has nothing. His blackness is a figment of white imagination. He is the cold and tortured shadow of white folks past. One light, one dark, each founding the other's weakness. Catch me if you can, man. He fucked my woman. He fucked my woman. He fucked and fucked my woman. I am not a man. Yeah, nigga. I fuck. Yeah, I beat that pussy up. I fuck. My woman, I fuck. My woman, I fuck all women. Clutch my swelling cock on street corners. Primary weapon, your perception. I big dick, nigga, joke a yoke and drag my masculinity behind me. This should all be far behind me. I stick it to my skin with pre cam fantasies of blood and white women's vaginal secretions. I beat her pussy up. She needs to suffer for what she's done to me by liking this mandingoism prism. They hold it up to the light. It's white. Out of me pours color never for be seen. I'm so black. This anti-bellum dream. This piece is called The Pond. I find myself in unfamiliar surroundings, staring at a large pond as it billows steam into a crisp September morning. I am thinking of a great many things and wondering about my father. He would be at home in this place. Crickets standing on their porches, yelling for their kids to come home. Dragonflies glistening like a woman's freshly glossed lips. Cold, cold air interrupted by the sun's warning to all below today will be hot and the pond will be full of every and any species of life that wants to be cool. I find myself at a familiar entry point in, un in uncommon surroundings, the unrest of insects, the friskiness of my pet, the wind disrupting silent leaves, creating millions of sounds in a single second. I am feeling small. This just might be the point. Allowing my petty and vain concerns to evaporate like the morning dew. The grass looks like it's on fire. I see smoke. I smell nothing but clean air and immediately stop writing to light a cigarette. I grin and acknowledge the hypocritical being that is reminded to smoke by a clean breeze, an invisible stream I feel, but never see. I wonder about my father. I am silent. My silence returns me to my origins. How did I arrive from all the chaos to a place of clean sounds and penetrating winds? What will I say when I finally return home? Most days, I am half, away of step, I'm half a step away from tears, tears of extreme gratitude, a baptism for my cheeks. This holy place on my face that a child might kiss, my dog might lick, that a lover, God willing, will caress. Just a half a step away from tears, but I do not move forward. I will not move the tears from the corners of my eyes to the corners of my mouth. Tears, love waiting on corners. Saline hoodlums that gather, collect salt and spit without a care for where their wetness lands. I'm imagining my father, lips pressing downward as he swallows his own smile, eyes beaming with the curiosity of a playing child, getting ready to speak with a slight hesitation. I'm talking to you. I'm talking about you, not me when I say this. I'm talking about you, thinking about you, imagining you were preparing to leave the pond and walk with me down a long and dusty trail. 
I just made love to myself. I just made love to myself with a broken heart and petroleum jelly. I edited a photo of you, laughed at my desperation, and took an antidepressant and cringed. A stranger said, you must be beating them off with a stick. My dick went limp, and a 24-year-old just grabbed a fistful of 42 years of me. You're hot, he says, and takes a hit of weed. We're not in East Oakland anymore. We are in our heads. Life is less awesome, more insecurity, and far beyond the leave me alones, the hold me's. Tell me something stupid you'll be ashamed of. Snatch me up by the nap of my hair. Fuck me and grease my scalp. Invent a smell. Become immune to my disease. The mattress is a blanket. I want every pound of you on top of me. Make it hard for me to breathe. And then I remember I'm the one who falls and you are all the leaves. First they look because I am beautiful. Then they stare, seeing how uncomfortable my beauty makes me. If I could only peel back my skin. These are my secrets. This is the sound of Snickers sliding between fangs. Their origin, insecurity, but you would prefer that they are in me. I can't defend myself. I won't risk making you feel how I feel now. I wonder if you know how. This is for the ugly little girl who hoped and hoped. Searching for what's beautiful, she smoked and smoked. No matter how hard she swishes, her hips aren't wide enough. Ruby slippers can't be less big. Drowning in the wake of her own step, she is swept away. Uh, this piece is called my black male body. My black male body does not belong to you. It is not yours. It will not submit under whip or word. My black male's body's purpose is not to further your personal or political agenda. You cannot liberate me. The idea that you can contradicts the concept that I'm already free. I am not a savage to domesticate or a slave to repossess. I am not an underdog because I've been past your test. My black male body's not in prison. My black male body's not contained. My black male body exists here. My black male body exists now. My black male body exists for itself and because of itself. My black male body is male. My black male body is male. My black male body is intimidating. My black male body is strong. My black male body is fighting you. I am not Martin Luther King. I am Jason, Damien, Khalil. I'm that nigga over there. I'm indicated by your fear. My black male body is black. My black male body is brown. My black male body is tan. My black male body is pale. My black male body is fooling you. I am not a movement, a waste, or felt potential. I am not a weapon, an excuse, or a grave. I am what I am, who I have been. I am who I need to be. I am Sambo. I am Zip Coon. I am Mandingo and I is pretty. My pain is not a canvas. My history is not a primer for your guilt. I am not a magnifying glass. You will not see yourself through me. You can never fire me because you never hired me. You cannot buy me or reimburse me for my labor. I am not an African. I am not a new Negro. I am not a poem. Romanticize yourself clearly. That's what you're used to. I am here for you. I'm here to be something other than you. Something for you to hate. Something at which you can marvel. I am not yours. But I'm not supposed to be. 
Not hardly. Not ever. Not possibly. Not in any light. At any time. In whatever dimension string theory distraction from the nowness that is me. You got exactly what you wanted. I am an obstacle. A grudge. An improvisation. I just have uh, two more pieces left. Is that okay for time? Cool. I just want to make sure. This piece uh, is called The Sanctuary, and I wrote it. The Golden Gate Bridge is right next to a gay nude beach where people are having sex and frolicking and getting sunburns and running around, carrying on, doing all kinds of things. So when I look at the Golden Gate Bridge as a barrier resident, I think of different things than maybe people from other places in the world do. <laughs> um, but I would often go there just to clear my mind and meditate. And this is a piece that I wrote about that experience called The Sanctuary. There was a fly I've never met licking my arm. Salt, be it mine or be it misted by the ocean. I've seen her, turquoise and blue in some far off destination, but home, she is gray like me. Here and only here she is comfortable. She is all of herself. She is sharks, both white and great. Is concrete hard for those who leap? Some people, do jump off bridges and live. I could be swallowed whole by water or wind. Once you're chewed, it makes no difference. This golden gated destination is the final one for those who want to be high, even if it lasts just for seconds. Father time's filthy boots pressed and kicking the horizon and the mind. The ancient waves giggle away, toss centuries old boulder until it's flower fine, like the flower men she burns, she browns, she tans. The black ones play near, not in. They say we can't tread water. We say if what happened before happens again, we'll go much freer if we can't swim. We are living monuments much too close to the massacre. Our bones are made of the ones who lived. Our skin is heavy and bronzed. We do not sing but run to the ocean floor to greet our family and friends. You are here frolicking. I am here feeling small. My mind, like my mind, like water drifts, like wood tightening in my shorts. It's good to grow. An empty throne, a tomb worshiping pagan, an absent mirror, seeing without a seer, into my womb, my virgin sanctuary. Quietly, there I was. Microscopic cosmic shard on the tongue of a bug I came to know. And this final piece is uh, called Make Me Black. Make me black. Paint me. Be sure and make it obvious. My lips should be full. My hair, exceptionally curly. I want each strand wound so tight that if I fell down the steps, I'd become a slinky. My eyes almond shaped and somewhat slanted. I'm not sure if that's African or Native American make them deep set and slanty. Take my oral tradition and forget it completely. Write down what you remember. Take my worth, multiply it by Nefertiti then divide it by crack whore, if you have a remainder. Snap your fingers to your own heartbeat, roll your neck once and spit every time you want to say nigger. Allow me to imitate you after you have made caricatures of me, embarrass me, have me make fool after fool of myself and when I'm done, giving it coon show, Haley bury me. Whisper Maya Angelou poems to the leaves, crush them, make sturdy pages I can write my nigger songs on. Tell me I'm not black if I'm articulate especially if your blue eyes are taken for granted. If your blue eyes are taken for granted, give them to me. I will make them more special than anything. Tell people who are white and black, they're automatically pretty. Be happy there are enough like you for you to finally understand something black. Call me something other than black. Teach me to be ashamed of my former names instead of Negro, colored, African-American. Tell me nigga is just the same, make me surly. Let's speed up what Darwin started. Take the best of us, put us on a boat. Let the weak ones die. When the weak ones are dead, 
Breed me with the largest and most agile buck. If you find me attractive, let's have babies and hold our babies above all babies. Let's be light-skinned and untarnished. Warn your children, we are sons of Ham, cursed and cursing. Mutilate me, beat my back something awful then laugh at my calluses. Rape my woman in front of me. Make laws and ensure I can never call her my wife. Give the woman I'm permitted to fuck in your absence children. Treat them as livestock. Treat them better than you treat her or me. Make a house nigga out of your daughter, Willie Lynch me. Beat me down and hang me off of trees. Confuse the hummingbird who does not know what to drink from. When I become aggressive, call me a thug. If I'm complacent, tease me. Call me a sellout and remind me again that I am not. Black continue to always punish me. Keep the written word a mystery. And when I don't speak English too good, confront me. Tell me that I'm lazy, then have me walk 100 miles through the swamps of Mississippi in the dark alone. If I reject being lazy, have the dogs chase me. So I know what it feels like to be tired. When I am tired, Rodney King me. Play the tape and ask me not to be moved. If I am moved or you become fearful of violence, watch me hurt myself and do nothing. Take my hurt, numb it with indifference. When I question my circumstance, call up the race card. When you don't care what I'm asking, ask for ID cards. Make me black. Police flashlights in my face so often that I'm only comfortable in a spotlight of a stage, an arena, court, field, or prison yard. Make me black. Thank you very much for having me and allowing me to share some of my work. I'm really grateful. It's an honor to be here. Thanks so much, Dazier. Uh, that was Dazier Grego Sykes. This is his um, new book, Black Faggotry, uh, newly out from Nomadic Press. It's definitely available from No. Uh, I, I bought this directly from Nomadic Press's website. It's probably better than going through Amazon. I, I don't. I think they they're probably even opposed to selling to Amazon and might not. <laughs> Um, we're going to take a quick 10 minute break, uh, during which time I would encourage the audience to donate to the Segway Foundation. Um, we pay our readers and anything that you uh, donate uh, will go directly to the poets. Um, and we'll see you in 10 minutes with Douglas A. Martin. Hey, welcome back to the reading. Um, I just want to make a quick announcement that next week uh, we're going to be joined by Derek McCormack and Sasha Banks, and it's going to be a special Halloween edition of uh, the Segway Reading Series. Uh, so we hope that uh, we hope that we see you there next week, same time, same place. And uh, now I'm going to uh, hand things over to Ven Daniel. Hey, thank you all for coming. Um, and uh, thank you for that, for sharing your poems. Um, that was a really incredible reading. I, it's so weird to, um, to be in the Zoom space because I wanted to like be a, an active audience participant, but I, I couldn't make my sounds shareable. Um, Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce Douglas and then we'll have him read. Uh, born in Virginia and raised in Georgia, Douglas A. Martin moved to New York at 25 and lives there still. Wolf, an anti true crime novel, was published recently by Nightboat Books, and Branwell, a novel of the Bronte brother, and an early work recently reissued by South Pole Press. Spanning fiction and nonfiction, Douglas's writing traverses poetry and prose, and has been translated into Italian, Japanese, and Portuguese, with Spanish forthcoming. Other titles include an autobiographical novel, Once You Go Back, a book of stories. They change the subject, and Miss Nightboat, Your Body Figured, novellas, Acker, a book-length essay, and a new 20-year anniversary edition of Outline of My Lover, an outline of my lover which is right here. It's a really, really beautiful book. Um, uh, and that book is an autofiction 
that's adapted in part by the Forsyth Company for their live film ballet, uh, Camera Camera, and praises as an international book of the year upon its initial release. Um, everybody, please welcome Douglas A. Martin. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming out. Um, I'm gonna read from this other complicated book that came out over the summer, Wolf. And I've been doing this thing, I'm planning to do this thing where I'm doing a kind of conceptual read through the book. So I um, have read from it two or three times now and I'm just gonna pick up where I left off last time I read from the book and I'm gonna read through for you know, my, my allotted time. Um, a lot of different voices come in and out, but um, hopefully it will be clear enough. And also I um, will say that the section that I'm reading, the stretch that I'm reading across is punctuated by numbers, but I'm just gonna take pauses to, to make for a smoother, smoother reading. Um, hi, Alicia. They would, they would say just anything at school, even when those others didn't know what they were talking about, laughing done out loud in versions of sing-along, when not more normally like yelling. Others try to get at him and the things they said, telling jokes like on TV, out from under bars they chase around, springs squeaking, mouths flinging back around, and firing pieces of trash thrown down some more and tetherball punched. How smart someone was is known by the things they said. They want the boy always to hear what is wrong with him. The names come out loud there, outside where feelings are turned up more, other feelings down around the buildings in brick. He has turned 11 already, although he might not look it. And then 12 doesn't make much of difference when he is mostly trying to stay out of the way. Before he learned and before the shelter was closed, the boy dropped down to kick around on the floor, then went back to where he belonged. At the shelter, he acts like he is not supposed to. In all the new places waiting for care, a last chance. And it happens that hands get smaller even, clenched when he goes onto the floor. He is so young is the reason, someone thinking they could keep him. And the boy gone on and on, squirming away until he backed up against a corner then wall, knowing the minute he went quiet, someone thinking he knew they could keep him, would be able to have him. It was where he would have to stay, all his movements only to ruin all the places when he wanted to just go home. Thinking made a space go smaller. Sometimes the right thing could be found to make the boy go quiet, but there is so much yelling before. People who know all things warn repeatedly about it. A boy's never calming down. A boy had to stop before places get all closed up and he is back there anyhow with the father. It goes on for so long when one is never big enough the boy isn't dumb. The boy calls out when wanting anything else, when still so small, wanting help. And they were all bigger than him. He had to stop it, or he knows where he was going. Was that what he wanted, to go home? Exactly all along he's known around these threats to calm down. Before the older brother also gets back, the younger spent most of his time aside alone there in a room where some of the men took breaks. Nights working, that was where they would go. It was a drive to get out to buildings where late afternoons and evenings got set down and the printing the father helped out with for the living is done. No matter what, the father would be bringing the boy along always. He would be waiting for the father to get done with a shift, the next one. The father goes there to help with moving around boxes. After is when the two of them get to get out of there. The boy is seen inside at a table used for other things than work for school. But when he was there like that, 
nobody was going to be getting hurt. Printed things moved past the windows and a door. He learned to keep quiet. The men came in, leaned against the counter, and then started laughing about how over on the calendars in the other room there were smiling that way all around women with mouths hung angels like they were getting ready to softly talk when undressed, say something. How the boy seemed to them there where the father worked was mostly shy, polite, and saying little to any of them, though they saw him back there coming by the father's work, customers that dropped off things needing copying. Please and pardon, sir, were the words to use, doing what the boy said was homework when it looked like he was drawing, studying. More things for the copying came in. The boy went back and forth with his pencil when more of the men came into the room, back to near where stock was kept and all the free spots in the spaces filled up with metal cabinets, shelves tanned, yellow, green. Then the father back there says how it would be just a little longer, little bit, more boxes to carry in. Watch what he is doing. It gets quieter in there when not back and forth with the same pencil pressed up against the table and coloring out over the shapes and grain designed underneath. That way they color through scratched. Something else the boy would rather be working on? Some place he'd rather be? Someone says the boy is nice looking. Sometimes another voice sounds like it might care how he might be, what he gets up to doing back there. Taking a nap? When the fluorescents don't flash, it is darker. And then, at work people see him all around, everything quieting down. Then the chairs in the break room get moved closer together. First wait while the men clean up a mess they've made. Everyone seeing how the boy has learned to stay out of the way. And before they go back home, he could sleep if he liked, before they got all ready for bed, ready for school the next day, his head put down, all right, they were going to have to get him a sleeping bag so it could be brought to work too. The father would say later when it was time to go. When it was just the younger, before the older boy had to return too, the father took off his boots, worn for the next shift. They would have something easy to eat if they were not already stopped by a place on the way home where nobody wanted to work. Everybody wanted to eat there, but nobody wanted to work there. That was not a place to end up the rest of your life. News flicks doesn't seem so important if no one was paying attention. The shelter had been her plan and big idea, at least for a little while, she would tried to say until something else could be done, some place to entrust all the boys off to needed to be found when ends could not be made to meet anymore, no her, no boys. Once she had started saving what she could, it was when she would go. Everyone had to understand. All these feelings had been there for a while, the two having a hard enough time keeping in any one place a roof overhead and everyone clothed. She is probably wearing all white the day when something has to be done. There are other boys for worrying about too. Someone says it would make the situation better, but Hatton, they were tired of each other, than everyone else in the house, and it can't go on anymore. It is when she had brought them into where it was going to be seen what could be found for them. No need wasting any more time worrying that little head of hair her she's given all the boys. They talk to him on the playground, most days at school trying to get him to say something, say something else over shoulders calling out around him. He isn't being realistic as the boy when acting like someone was always trying to hurt him, that way he carries on there. After school they are going to ride around in the car resting out, lips of another who says things just to be saying them, anything, 
get all pink, thick up in the face, and tells another one another day. Bet he knows what the father does, always trying to put it into different words, the same insult. Bet they know what those two were going to do when they were not off there at the school anymore. Turn around so they can say it to his face, hey, go ahead and hold him down on the playground while he is caught calling for someone. Another position to try to shield in is hands up over face or with your arms up over your head. And like when even younger, going down inside the self, try to find a way for getting gone. Bet how one day it is going to be the garbage truck he was going to be riding around in soon. Here's something to eat, a sandwich, putting it back down in the dirt. Know what is said about who was responsible for his being there? The only reason why those boys had ever been born, all of them? That's how it was, wasn't it? When coming from a place that goes around, picking up the trash, whatever the father is doing all night, all day. Looks like still not enough. He needs needs to do something more to take care of them. Look, no one aspires to what goes around there, all the possibilities meant to shame. See the clothes, taunts come in ways, chasing more around, shoving around on stalls of the merry-go-round, making it go faster. How old, how old, the next step down going to be found. Where was anyone now, they wanted to know. How about he worked in the kitchen now? Is that what he does? Whatever they think of to say, everyone playing there but him, probably going to be a janitor someday. Something they said just to say things like he was dead, meat, come over there. Others had quicker ideas. Look at the way he was no matter what they said, even before he knows what it meant, even then already, they were saying the things until a friend was found how it was supposed to be bad, those things said behind his back. The friend's place is inside what was called a mobile home park. It is a big place for a trailer with a fence that went around the entire lot high up over the boy's head one fence around the trailer itself he had made of wood. Inside the main, there were a few more the friend had built, more things. Just because of where it was didn't mean there couldn't be a lot of nice things. They were inside. It was for his own protection, the friend said. They go over if the father doesn't have to work the next day. A couple of nights he doesn't or sometimes just for a bit after work for dinner. He had been just about the father's best friend for a time, long time they'd known each other. The bits of the extended family the father didn't want to see anymore knew all about him. He was someone who in the past had been caught at things, the friend, but it had been a few years since. He made his money through the odd job here and there Stuff like someone's air conditioner, fixing those up when it's got to be gotten somewhere. That is a mechanic still. And there were other things he knew how to do too. Saying how it was never too early to start learning a trade. He'd shown some other boys before around there. He had been a friend of the mother even before the boy's father so much, her and her brother, when they were all much younger and she was still someone around in their lives before nowhere then to be found. They were all friends. When the older gets back, the friend says how it could feel that way for all of them, both the boys. The first time he had ever been brought over, supposed to be good, the youngest must have been around seven or eight. Then they don't go home. Then they don't go home. Then they don't go over there for some time. It could be almost like a second home if they liked. It would be a little later, a little older, when he sees how the trailer could truly be. In the beginning, the father gets the boy a blanket with pictures on it of animals in robed colors faded out. The blanket is brought along with a pillow when they are going nights, they wouldn't be home until very late. The father gets the boy whatever he can, though that would never be a lot. 
in the beginning, on occasion, even a few toys he brought over and a game thing he held in hand. He can be left to sleep in a bedroom down at the end of a short paneled hall. It was nice to have somewhere else to go sometimes, wasn't it? When it was just the one, it was how it was. Boys were there for his showing them how to do it. If a boy could do anything in the world he wanted, whatever, what was that that the boy would want to do? What would he like to do when he grew up? when he got older? What would it be like when he had to raise a boy himself someday? What was he going to do then? Here was why the fingers of the father sometimes looked like they had the grease on them. Here was how it looked up under a hood. Just like the father said he did himself, the friend would show he knew some things, things about cars. Probably didn't know how they used to fix them up together, did he? Did the boy's father tell him that? One of the first few times he had ever been brought over, the boy was asked what kind of a car he liked. He answered with the one he knew easily how to say, Corvette. Some nicer cars were around there, not like the one they were always coming over in, huh? One day they could try to get that one, that shadow he was going to one day buy. That friend would show them all some things he knows. In the living room, they talk of how she was, how she had always said she was going to be the one who left. She stayed close until she found someone else, someone she thought could take better care of her. He wanted to believe he loved her. That was a reason, but not right. It depended who he was talking to, what the father said. Everyone always asked about her first. What she needed another one for was taking better care of her. She felt how with a nicer one, nice house, nobody would ever be able to get to her. Some of the boys the two of them had when they weren't married weren't even living with them anymore. Must have thought there was something to be said for never having just one of anything. She needed that time alone to spend with someone else she wouldn't even look at him anymore. Someone else might become the father. Five or six or so years of being happy, sure, but that was not how she was gonna end up coming home saying she had been out working. She was only doing it until she got a little older. She meant that every one of the boys there were going to have to be gotten rid of, not just the worst. Not only the good ones, no good. She needed a break, and it was years then without her. The stretches of her disappearing before he was not even counting. He had to know he was not the only one. He knew the name of the state where she was, and he said how they might go there someday. But that was something they would never do. She goes away first. They had only lived together until she could get some money together. Still think she was coming back? How well did he think she was doing? How well really off with that new one she got? They would have at her, the men. The father talking about how they shared the house, but then priorities shift. Someone saw to that. There was a question of legal custody, but what else to do with the one? It started going wrong when those boys kept coming. She needed to get away, but she kept having more. Some easier to separate, two of them were twins. She decided how she could leave for good once she got them all taken care of, put into good hands, she believed, all together four, but not all of them with the same father. The younger boy, for his part, played quietly later on the couch. A laugh track on one channel goes racing around, flip the last few things past graphic words, traced down deep into the room. He was getting like he sometimes would around the father, almost, but the boy was different. He hadn't forgotten about all those other brothers of his, had he? With all of them being over there, it would get louder, She'd gone off and changed her name. Why? Tell them. They wanted to know this. What does he think she has been doing off all this time? 
what does he think she would be saying about him? She's one of those ones who bent over signs in the sky, up and down along a highway, gone where the big trucks drove, bending down up there in a position to give a little extra something to go on, get at, urge, bet he wished someone like her had never even existed. One of the ones up there with her hand held out, even though she was going to one day no longer be something for others to do, finger wet in front of a red mouth, then was a runaway, one way for others to have a good time. From time to time, it was on and off before it started again regularly that at least once a week they went over. Along the tips of one fence around the trailer at the top, it was razor-like, sharp in strands of circled wire. Though it was makeshift, touching it even a bit would hurt and electrocute anyone trying to climb over it ever, the friend said. When the fence was opened at night, lights in the dark open out, sweep around in the part of the yard. If everyone, ever anyone tried to come up to knock, if ever anyone came over late at night trying to surprise him. Inside was where the friend had himself all set up. The camera of a security system he had made himself look down around there in the yard. A camera set up so that whatever was going on out there he could see. And to the sides, if anyone tried to get in who hadn't told the friend how they were coming over, Pretty soon a boy wanted to know when he could start smoking. Soon it would be that grinding on about how he didn't have any freedoms, not at home. Then he wasn't remembering how old he was. Pretty soon a boy wanted to start trying to use the words on the channels that played when they thought he would still be back there. In the back there, both thought where he had gone to sleep. Up there on the couch, the father says, it's no place for him. He couldn't sleep there. In the back room is a collection of more cameras. In a smaller room, older ones. It is good to know how all these things work and the friend would show him how to use them. He could have anything in the world, whatever that would be, if he wanted to. And okay, once he had it figured out, then how was the boy going to go about the making it happen? Once the older boy got back home, it would be a new situation for all of them. It was something they were all going to have to try to learn to grow more into when if it was going to be a special school or nothing for the older boy, he was coming back there to live with them. All wheels around them turned there to the sides of the car driving forward, the younger and then older to work going to keep on with lives, a situation they would all have to get used to, wouldn't want him growing up like it when the father has been working so hard for all along, he said, to have them all back there together again. Driving along by all the buildings that never got too tall, the father took the boys past all trees getting thinner into an area where there was never plenty enough of for staying behind going off down towards around where the highway started. He had been lucky to have been in their care all this time. The boy must have known they were only doing what was right. One day he was bound to remember how good it might have been, something for him to think about. They'd done what any family in their place would have, they said, should have seen that. Whatever the boy might have needed, they had tried to give him the very best when they before had him, everything. They did not have to give him anything anymore. So little they'd asked of him. They swore a family who had a life all planned out for him, a life for him he was getting away from. They would not want him there even for another month. They were not going to be able to take care of him even for another minute then. They could be no longer responsible. The boys were not going to keep getting those chances they had been giving him, the older one. It had been the last time, the latest in long line of failed attempts, all those years trying to make a place for him in homes. It never worked out, not for too long, though they kept trying. 
six years that is longer than the little brother could even remember. That boy had stopped cooperating in any way. For more than six, seven years, they had tried their very hardest with him. Couldn't say they had not given him everything. What did he think he was going to do? Whatever he wanted? All any of the families the older boy had ever been with, all they'd ever asked was so very little of him, all the fosters said, asking him never to lie. If he could not see clearly how much better off with this family who had taken him in, he had been. If living with the one is going to make it all harder for all of them, that when he was getting his last chance, there was nothing left to do. So there the brother was going back to another school because the father had to figure out what was going to be done. Nothing but the house, sending him off back to living like before. If he could not at least do those little things he was supposed to do, little things they tried to do right by him. Brother was not going to be one of them. That's not who he was ever going to be. Ah, oh, with the father, principal at another better high school, wife and children matching. Someone was going to have to make it right again. How were they ever going to be able to do anything with him, keeping on the way he was? They tried to keep help him grow up in a way where he was going to be better off with what originally started out he'd been given. If anyone could have accomplished it, that last family believed they would be the ones finally straightening him out and giving him some guidance. He didn't want to make something more important of his life, it seemed. If he couldn't live within a few guidelines simply set down, few rules established, going on the way he is, it would be out of their hands completely. He would be left to his real father. They asked him if that's where he wanted to go. They had first checked about getting the permission for a military school. Rather, if nobody could, the father would take care of him. They would just give the boy back, hated to do it, but they had done what they guessed they had to when didn't want to keep punishing him because that boy couldn't seem to learn when he wouldn't cooperate, even the slightest, that or nothing, the boy comes back to the house with the father coming to get him and they would all start trying to be together again. He was just gonna have to see how he liked it if nobody else could deal with him. I'm gonna stop there. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Douglas. Yeah.